This is Brother Ron, and welcome to We All Be News Radio and TV, the news free Dixie for the 21st century. chance to listen to the uh, rapper Killer Mike's interview on the NRA TV? Yeah, I thought it was good. I hated it when he cried to qualify. Yeah, I didn't see anything wrong he said out of line at all. It, even if it was out of line, it still was his opinion and he's entitled to it, but he basically, to my, my, my understanding, he was talking about why African Americans should arm themselves and protect their homes. And I don't see a problem with it, but they'll act like he was trying to made light of what the kids were doing uh, on Saturday. And what was interesting to me is that Dr. King's granddaughter, now, when I look at the history, the alternative history of the ones they don't talk about, Dr. King's life was actually uh, uh, lengthened by him having armed black men around him, like the March against the Spirit, Biggest for Defense. And I know I talked to Charles Edwards on several occasions. And this is Mega Edwards' brother. He said Dr. King used to run to his house down in Jackson because I feel safe because y'all have all the guns and goons, Charles. And Charles Edwards stayed with a gun. You know what I'm saying? But Dr. King felt safe around black men with guns. Same thing with Captain Jerry Williams, who was organizing the police detail for Dr. King. And the last time he was in Memphis, he didn't, he didn't have their police protection. Well, he um, did have police protection. See, this is what it's about. Mm -hmm. Um there were six black cops, six black detectives and sergeants that were acting as his bodyguard crew. Mm -hmm. And their commander said, all of you have threats against your lives. You need to come down here to the uh, downtown station. They refused. Right. They came out, ordered them, made them leave. Mm -hmm. Well, there was one officer who was up at the fire station doing a responsible overwatch thing. Yeah. And he refused to leave. There was one black fireman up there and they told him his son had been critically injured in an accident, so he mm -hmm. leaves to go check on his son. Turns out the son's fine. He mm -hmm. told him that I'll be back to said, Don't worry about it, take the day off. Okay. This particular officer, who is there, gets told you are immediately you are ordered immediately to headquarters. He said, "I'm not going." They called him again. I'm not going. He says, I'm not going. So they send down 10 white officers riding in two squad cars. They jump him. They double handcuff him. And they hog tie his legs with a rope. They manhandled him back out, threw him in the back seat of a car, and drove him off. Mm hmm Then, 
guess what? But that's when he got killed, within 15 minutes of that. Hmm. And see the other thing? Edgar Hoover personally called off the auditory and visual surveillance of King 48 hours before he got shot. That's the first time it had stopped in years. And see, one of his advisors is the one that told King to stop having a pistol. You see, if you're going to be nonviolent, you can't have a pistol. Who was that advisor he had that was uh, on the other side? Oh, the, 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 the Dr. King? Yeah, the gay one. Oh, uh, by Rustin. Rustin. Oh, by Rustin, yeah. Yeah, that was the one that kept telling him you don't need a gun. See, but King even had a gun. He had good sense. They just talked right. him out of it. Mm-hmm. But he was protected by guys with guns. I mean, after that woman stabbed him up in Harlem doing that book signing. I mean, he, he, if you don't understand, like, you know, even Malcolm X, one of his biggest mistakes was not having guns on his bodyguards at the Audubon. And he also, at one point, had, you know, when he had the rallies at the Audubon, it would be a police presence at the Audubon, but it was all uh, blocks away from there or whatever. But normally they say you would have three dozen police officers on the scene when, not him, but the city, when he was doing his rallies at the Audubon. And Dr. King, uh, you know, it makes a difference. I mean, I just think that we not told that history. We think everything was nonviolent, but that's not the truth. I mean, I had friends of mine who was in Mississippi. They talking about getting in shootouts with the sheriff and the Klan and throwing Molotov cocktails. I mean, these are black people down south getting in shootouts with the Klan. But they don't talk about that part in the history books. That's it. Uh, that is very much it. So, you see, it does not do us as a people any good to be unarmed. Right. <laughs> it does us absolutely no good. So you, Obviously, that officer mm-hmm. was Ed Reddick. Did yeah, I'll say Ed Reddick, yeah. And removed yeah. from the scene. Yeah, I had talked to him before on the show. Uh, he has some interesting insights. But like he said, and it's something that he told me that was very powerful. It's like I, I advise people, in my mind, that if you, you should never be a broke person who loves easy money and perks running for office. A broke person has no business running for office without no, you know, who just loves perks and easy money. Because you think it, it, it you're going to be doing football numbers in the pen. And there's no reason why people should be running for office just to have a paycheck. You should be running for office to serve the people. That's it. And see, too many of our be leadership look at it as a money-making proposition rather than as a leadership one. And that's the wrong way to look at it. <laughs> that's right. They aren't about service. They're about exploitation. 